Hey everybody, and welcome to our webinar. Before we get started, can everybody see me? Can everybody hear me? Can everybody see the whiteboard? Let me know in the chat, and then we'll go ahead and get rolling. Finally, <laughs> thank you all so much for your patience with getting this one started. Uh, that's just the way life works when you're getting into a studio. But again, thank you for your patience. Hopefully this webinar justifies the extra nine, 10 minute wait. <laughs> so glad uh, that some of, some of you guys have seen some of my videos before. Um, really quickly, just to introduce myself, my name is Erica. Uh, I have been working with Veritas Prep for quite a while now, teaching classes, tutoring, um, doing some of these live streams every now and then. And soon you guys are going to see some YouTube videos from me on the Veritas Prep channel. So that's really exciting as well. So very cool. Um, you guys have probably I mean, I don't know, that's quite vain. You guys may have seen me before um, on the internet, uh, specifically here on YouTube. Um, I've done quite a few videos here. Um, I've also spent some time on various forums. Um, I've been in the test prep industry for quite some time. It's pretty much my life. <laughs> um, and I really love uh, the GMAT in particular. Um, so I'm really excited to be here today to talk about one of my favorite topics, modifiers, and specifically modifier rules that people mess up. So really excited to get going today. Who here uh, is not a huge fan of modifiers? Who here gets nervous? when they see modifiers. Let me know in the chat. Well, I go ahead and pop us over to our next slide. All right, seeing that Alina attended inequalities, cool. Yeah, that was, that was a fun one. I like inequalities as well. Yeah, so I'm seeing a few people coming in the chat. We've got a bit of a delay. Um, folks who, yeah, are not huge fans of modifiers. Modifiers are a pain, Samarth, I get you, right? They are one of the more complex subjects on sentence correction, right? Sentence correction is already really memorization heavy. Um, some of our other sections on the GMAT are a little bit more logic based, right? This whole test is meant to test our logic, our critical thinking, our problem solving, right? Now, sentence correction is the same way, they just test it on a foundation of knowledge, right? Same with how quant tests our problem solving, our critical thinking, etc., on a foundation of math. So, there's a lot of memorization. In it, that we need in order to be able to succeed on sentence correction. And specifically, modifiers has a lot of memorization within it. <laughs> Sahib, I would sooner solve a physics problem than attempt a modifier problem. Hopefully after today, you're feeling a little bit more complicated. So kind of our agenda for the day. We're gonna do a really quick intro to modifiers. This is not gonna be comprehensive. Um, I'm gonna talk you guys quickly through the four different types of modifiers that we really wanna know, but it is going to be quick. If you're going, I don't know what that is, maybe this is something to you know take a screenshot of, jot down, and do a little bit of research on later. So we're gonna do that very quick intro to modifiers, and then we're gonna talk specifically about four higher level things in modifiers that test takers kind of make mistakes with, that test takers struggle with, right? So if this is a little confusing to you guys, we're not gonna be covering all of the details here, so this is not comprehensive. We are specifically focusing on four higher level things that can be mistakes. But I will hang out afterwards if you guys have more questions on modifiers. So we are gonna do an intro to modifiers, talk about our four different modifier types, and then give the general rule for modifiers. Note that rule is in quotes. And then we're gonna talk about the four modifiers rules that most test takers get wrong. So we're gonna start with why sentence placement matters for participial phrases. So that's our ING and EDs. I saw a lot of you guys talking about how the answer choices rearrange things. Oh yeah, it matters. We're gonna talk about that here. Then we're gonna talk about why relative clauses, so that's our WHs and our thats, and the positives, those are our noun phrases, aren't quite as restrictive as they're made out to be. Everybody's like, which is so specific. Turns out it's not as specific as we think. Why prepositional phrases are surprisingly versatile, kind of similar, and why parallelism and modifiers go hand in hand. So. 
These are the four topics for today. Um, as an FYI, we do have a little bit of a delay in the chat, but the chat is gonna be our tool for communicating, so for answering problems for you guys to ask any questions that you have. So if you do have questions, feel free to throw those in the chat. I won't see it right away, just because there is maybe like a 12 second delay. Um, and then when we do problems, you guys will be answering there. No poll, low tech today. All right, so quick intro to modifiers. There are four types of modifiers that we really need to be comfortable with in order to succeed here. So our first type of modifier is our participial phrase. Participial phrases are phrases that start with an ing word or an ed word. So a quick example would be, I ran through the haunted house screaming. Screaming, ing, is gonna be a participial phrase. Or, I ran through the haunted house terrified. Terrified, ed, participial phrase. All right, our relative clauses, those are our WHs and that. So that's gonna be which, who, where, uh, when, that sort of thing. So an example, um, the party will be at my house, which is painted blue, relative clause. A positives are noun phrases that redefine a noun. Um, so for instance, uh, my brother, Logan is in college. So there, Logan is in a positive describing who my brother is. And then finally, prepositional phrases. Those are phrases that start with a preposition, right? So prepositions are gonna be those short uh, kind of relationship words like of, to, from, in, under, on, behind, below, between, among, all of those sorts of words. So for instance, I put the groceries on the table. On the table is where I put the groceries. So on the table would be a prepositional phrase. Those are the four that we're gonna be talking about today. Again, if there's any of you who are like, I don't know what that means, we're gonna do some more examples of those coming up, but maybe take note of the ones you're not feeling so sure about and do a little research on your own. So the general rule for all of these types of modifiers, and this is the general rule, again, rule in quotes, is that modifiers should be right next to the things they describe, right? And that's for clarity, right? We want it to be really clear what our modifier describes. So usually we wanna slap them right next to their subject, usually. <laughs> But our first three modifier misconceptions are going to challenge that rule. They are going to break that rule. So, very fun. Let's go ahead and take a look. So, our first modifier misconceptions has to do with participial phrases or our INGs and EDs. Now, of these rules, this is most likely the one that you know, right, or that you've thought about. Folks who are talking in the chat about rearranging sentences, right, and the answer choices being kind of moved around, this is what this is, right? So this is the one you're most likely to already know, but it's also the most important one to know because it will 100% definitely be tested on test day. You really need to be comfortable with it. So participial phrases, or ing or ed phrases, can go in three places. Participial phrases can go at the beginning of a sentence. Now, when they're at the beginning of the sentence, they describe the noun immediately after. So, for instance, in this sentence, we've got bombarded by bullets, the troops retreated. So, bombarded by bullets here is a participial phrase. It's got that ED. It could be an ING, doesn't matter, still both participial phrases. And since it's at the beginning of the sentence, it's going to describe the noun right after it. So here we are saying the troops were bombarded by bullets while they retreat. Cool? So here, bombarded by bullets describes the troops. This makes sense, this fits our rule. In the middle of a sentence, a participial phrase is going to describe the noun immediately before. So here we see trained by professionals, again, another ED, could be an ING, doesn't matter. Since it's in the middle of the sentence, it's gonna describe the noun right before it. Dogs. So here we are saying the dogs are trained by professionals. And we're saying the dogs that are trained by professionals are much more obedient 
than dogs who are not trained by professionals. Then, <laughs> this is where things get funny. What if we put them at the end of the sentence? Now, we would think, okay, it's like when it's in the middle, it should describe the noun before, because that's what's true for most types of modifiers. It's true for our relative clauses. It's true for our appositives. It's true for our prepositional phrases. But specifically for participial phrases, so that's ing's and ed's. If we put this sucker at the end of the sentence, it no longer describes the noun before. Now, it doesn't even describe a noun. It describes the whole clause before. So let's take a look at an example. Kit Carson roamed the Rockies and the Southwest, working as a trapper and establishing a reputation as one of the most able mountain men of his time. Okay, so there are two modifiers happening here. Working as a trapper, oops, <laughs> shorter than I thought. Working as a trapper, and then establishing a reputation as one of the most able mountain men of his time. So yeah, what we're seeing here is that it's an action. It's describing Kit Carson while he's roaming the Rockies in the Southwest. Now, if we were to think it was the same as those, we would say, okay, working as a trapper describes the Southwest or the Rockies in the Southwest? That doesn't make sense. Those are mountains. Mountains don't work as trappers. They also don't establish reputations as mountain men because they're mountains, not mountain men, right? So what we are saying here is that these things describe that whole shebang. This is also true even for ED modifiers. Great question, Samarth. So this is true for all of our participial phrases, INGs and EDs. Now, when they're at the end of the sentence, in certain cases, especially if they're not set off with a comma, they can describe the thing right before. But typically when we see them set off with a comma at the end of the sentence, they're describing the whole dang clause. Yeah, so a couple, a couple of exceptions where it can describe the noun right before, but especially if you see this comma, right, we're going to be describing the whole class. Super neat. So what this means is that we can't just use our rule of it's right next to the thing it describes. We have to look at where it's placed. We have to look at its placement in the sentence and that's gonna tell us what it describes. Now we can also check this by using logic, right? So this is at the end of the sentence. So I'm going, okay, this likely describes the entire clause unless I'm in one of those weird cases, maybe without a comma, where it just describes the thing right before. So I'm gonna use my logic to go, does working as a trapper logically describe these mountains? No, it doesn't. It can describe a man who is roaming these mountains, right? The man who roamed the mountains. So look at placement when you have a participial phrase, an ing or an ed, to determine what it describes. All right, let's go ahead and try a problem. So as you do this problem, remember that this rule about how at the end of the sentence we describe the whole shebang only applies for ing and ed modifiers. It does not apply for other types of modifiers. All right, let's go ahead and give this one a go. Let's take, let's try two minutes. I think two minutes will be plenty of time. Go ahead and answer in the chat when you think you've got it. Two minutes, good luck.
All right, nice work. Most everybody here got the correct answer, which is D. So discussing why this is, it seems like most of you guys got this. Again, this is the role that you guys are most likely to know of the four. So um, looking at this original, hopefully we're going, okay, which we know it describes the closest noun, right? Because even though it's at the end of the sentence, this rule about INGs and EDs does not apply because it's not an ING or an ED. It's a witch. So I'm going, okay, closest noun, expected. Mmm, that's not a noun. Bleaker, mmm, that's not a noun. Ooh, and then we get a verb? No. There is no noun for this to describe. Can't do it. No can do. So any of these answers with which aren't gonna work. Now E, same logic. A positives must describe nouns right? And they must describe the closest noun, but there isn't a noun close to it. Expected, not a noun. Bleaker, not a noun. And then we get a verb. Not allowed, right? We can't jump a verb to describe something else. We would need something like uh, the economic report released today by Congress and the Federal Reserve was bleaker than expected, or sorry, created a bleaker than expected situation a situation that is even more deep, blah, 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 right? So we would need a noun for it to describe, can't do it, right? C, if we go ahead and slash and burn this sucker, right? We're gonna figure out that C is not actually a sentence. It's not a complete sentence, doesn't work, not gonna be our guy, which means that it has to be D, right? So here, suggesting all right, if this was at the beginning or in the middle of the sentence, this would describe the closest noun, but it's not. It's at the end, which means it describes the entire previous clause. It describes the fact that the economic report was released today by Congress and the Federal Reserve and that it was bleaker than expected. Suggesting. And that's why this is the correct answer. Now, uh, Preetha's asking, the report is suggesting why not A or B? This is simply to do with the rules for modifiers describing a noun. We cannot jump a verb to describe a noun. That noun needs to be next to it. Cool. All right, so that is the reason. The answer is D, A and B and E. So those are relative clauses, that is a and a positive. They need to describe nouns that are next to them. There is no noun that's next to them, which is why we bring in suggesting to let it describe the whole clause. If we remove the comma, no, even without the comma, that's still not gonna be a complete sentence. I would recommend trying slash and burn there. Um, so slash and burn where we take out just like um, adjectives, adverbs, modifiers, things that are descriptive and see if you're left with a complete sentence, and you won't be. We're gonna be left with, the economic report was bleaker suggests. Doesn't really make sense. We're kind of stacking two verbs there. All right, let's try one more, uh, just to make sure that we're really solid on this, uh, before we go ahead and move on to our second modifier misconception. So let's go ahead and take two minutes to solve this one. Go ahead in the chat, two minutes.
All right, yeah, so you guys nailed this one. This one is in fact B. So here, this one's ever so slightly different, right, um, than the other one, because if we look before our witch, a noun. Wow, cool. The sun, which is lead. It works. Technically. All right, well, there's this R deserving problem here. But technically, something like E or C, C, like maybe E, right? Maybe E, we're going, okay, we're going, all right, which? It describes the sun, technically, grammatically correct. However, we have to think logically here. Is it the sun that's led to heated debates over which of these objects deserve the classification planet? No, the sun is not leading to anything. All right, maybe it could be this whole phrase, planet-like objects orbiting the sun. So orbiting the sun is just a modifier describing planet-like objects. More on this later. We're going, all right, the planet-like objects lead to the heated debates. Okay, maybe, that's okay, that could work. However, has led, singular, right? Planet-like objects, plural, that's not gonna work, right? So if it was planet-like objects which have led, okay, maybe, maybe a little bit. But, it would have to describe sun, so that one's not good, that one's not good, that one's not good. So we're between B and D, which have got our I and G, very nice, so either ing or ed is a participial phrase. If it's at the end of the sentence, it can describe the whole thing. So then we're going, okay, let's describe the whole thing. Astronomers discovered several distant planet-like objects orbiting the sun. Cool. So it's saying that whole thing, the fact that the astronomers discovered these objects has led to these heated debates. All right, so then deciding between B and D, this is a little bit different. We're just looking at verb tense. Is it deserve or are deserving? There's really no need for a continuous tense here. We don't need an ing. Let's just stick with simple present, deserve. So this one's B. Nice work, all right. Moving right along to our second rule. And we had a little bit of, of a hint at the second rule on the previous slide. So, no matter where relative clauses and appositives are in the sentence, they describe the closest noun, right? Doesn't work like <laughs> ing's. Oh, thank you, trying to be as dramatic as possible, Samarth. <laughs> so, no matter where they are in the sentence, they're gonna describe the closest noun, right? So we're going, all right, Relative clauses, these are my WHs or thats. Appositives, these are my noun phrases. So relative clauses can't go at the beginning of the sentence, but they can go in the middle or at the end. You're just never gonna see it at the, at the beginning of the sentence. It's just not gonna happen, right? So for instance, Susan, who lives next door, no, let's underline that. Who lives next door is coming to the party, which will be awesome. So here we have two relative clauses, and they're describing the closest nouns to each of them. So who lives next door describes Susan, which will be awesome describes party. Um, it would be the exact same thing if that were used. The only thing about that compared to which is that that is never gonna have a comma because it's something that's necessary to the sentence. But it still grammatically works the same. It's still a relative clause, still needs to be right next to the thing it describes. A positives, so those are those noun phrases, right? They can go at the beginning of the sentence, unlike relative clauses. Now at the beginning of the sentence, they're gonna describe the noun immediately after. That's just the same as part of participial phrases. So for instance, a gifted student and talented musician, so two parts, a gifted student and talented musician. John graduated from USC with highest honors. So those things are describing John. Now, positives can also go at the middle or end of the sentence where they're gonna describe the noun before, right? So it's like a participial phrase in the middle of the sentence, exact same as a relative clause. So then we're going, okay, John, the lead singer of the band, so that's describing John, has laryngitis and inflammation of the voice, voice box, so that's describing 
laryngitis. Good to go, right? This all makes sense. But here's a question. What if the closest noun is part of a noun phrase? Hmm. Let's take a look. So let's look at an example. The bench by the pond, which was recently painted, is my favorite place to read a book. All right, if we look at this really strictly, right, going closest noun, it has to be the noun that is literally right next to the comma. We're gonna go, okay, which was recently painted describes pond. But that doesn't make any sense. The pond was painted? That's a body of water. How are we gonna paint a pond? Not super logical, right? So what it's instead gonna describe is this whole noun phrase, the bench by the pond. So by the pond is one of those prepositional phrases, which means we can basically slash and burn it from the sentence if we want. And instead, which was recently painted is describing the bench, but specifically the bench by the pond. So, when we have a relative clause or an appositive next to a noun phrase, it can describe either the noun that is immediately next to it or the whole noun phrase that is immediately next to it. So there are a couple of options, right? Another example, John spent last weekend visiting the University of Southern California, his alma mater. All right, his alma mater, a positive noun phrase, describing a noun. Closest noun is Southern California. So did he graduate from Southern California? That's the school he went to? No, that doesn't really make sense, right? That's not a school, that's a location. So instead, we're gonna take the whole noun phrase, University of Southern California. So it can be either which means we have to use logical meaning once again to determine which noun or noun phrase the relative clause describes. Now, if we have either a noun or a noun phrase it can describe, it doesn't mean that it's ambiguous if the meaning is clear. So here, technically could describe pond, but that doesn't make sense. Not allowed. Technically could describe Southern California, but it doesn't make sense. Not allowed. All right, uh, Samarth has a question that's actually uh, pretty similar. The box of chocolates, which are very sweet, is kept on the table. So in this case, we have a clue with R. R can only refer to a plural noun, so it has to describe chocolates, right? It can't describe box because box is singular. Now, if they were both plural, then that would be like, which one, right? Unclear, maybe a little bit confusing. Um, if the sentence was the bench which was painted by the pond, that's getting a little hairy. We typically don't like to separate our subjects from uh, prepositional phrases. Usually subjects and prepositional phrases we like to be as close as possible. Yeah, so many exceptions, a lot like organic chemistry. Personally, I like this better than organic chemistry and I studied science in school, but there's a lot less to memorize here. There's really like these big four. All right, so, um, sorry, looking at this one, the logical is university of, but what if the underlying portion is his alma mater? What should I think the phrase modifies? Oh, so like what if we could change this part? Then we have to check for logic, right? Depending on what this says, it could describe either one. For instance, if we go, um, John spent last weekend visiting the University of Southern California where he grew up. All right, then it's more likely to describe Southern California. But that's a little bit weird because University of Southern California, we usually think of as one thing, but that would be okay. Yeah, bench by the house, which was recently painted, that would be ambiguous. Is it the bench? Is it the house? I don't know. Appositives are noun phrases, um, uh, Indrian. So that might be one to look up on your own time just to make sure you're really confident. All right. So now that we know this rule, that relative clauses and appositives can describe the closest noun 
or a noun phrase and that we have to use logical meaning to determine which one it describes. Let's go ahead and try a sentence. Let's take two minutes, go ahead and answer this one in the chat. Good luck. All right, yeah, the majority of you guys got this one. This one is A. It's fine the way it is. Now, a lot of folks are going, there is no way it's correct because an advancement that has already reduced successful attacks by over 50%, that's in a positive. A positive is described the closest noun, and the closest noun is increasingly troublesome cyber attacks. Cyber attacks aren't an advancement that doesn't make any sense, right? It doesn't, you're right, which is why it doesn't describe increasingly troublesome cyber attacks. It describes a new approach for dealing with increasingly troublesome cyber attacks. With increasingly, tire, increasingly troublesome cyber attacks describes dealing for dealing, blah, 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 describes a new approach. So it's describing that whole entire noun phrase, even though there are nouns in between. So this is actually fine the way it is. Now we can also rule out the other answer choices for other reasons. Right away, we're maybe a little bit skeptical of these beginning with and. And is, and is not a super great way to connect things in the sentence. Right? Because it doesn't give much of a relationship other than both of these things. Right? A modifier usually does a better job of clarifying the relationship. Right? We're saying the approach is an advancement. Right? So, we're skeptical of C, D, and E. We can also go in and use uh, tense. We're going, okay, this was last year and since then it has reduced successful attacks by over 50%, so we're really liking has already reduced. So we definitely don't want had already reduced. I don't love this guy right here for just reduced. Um, looking at these guys, we're also going, okay, if we have a comma and uh, that's not a complete sentence. We would like a subject here. This, we would also need a subject and a verb, but not a complete sentence, not E. Has to be A. Nice work on this one. This would also be true if this were a which clause. So if this said, which. Last year, engineers at a local software firm developed a new approach for dealing with increasingly troublesome cyber attacks, which has already reduced successful attacks by over 50%. 
fine. A okay sentence. One, because has already, it doesn't quite make sense with cyber attacks, but two, it just doesn't logically make sense. Why would cyber attacks reduce successful attacks? Doesn't make sense. It has to describe approach logically. So what's wrong with C? The and is not a great connector. Similarly, we don't have that present perfect has already reduced. It's just less clear, right? We're going, when did that happen? Did it happen last year? Did it happen, you know, is it still happening? Was it done reducing it by 50% a while ago? Is it still happening right now? The reason for not be is had already reduced, so this is a verb reason. This would mean this is past perfect. That means it happened before last year. So it happened before we developed the approach. Doesn't really make sense. All right, moving right along to our next modifier misconception, still kind of on the same subject. Prepositional phrases, right? Under the bed, on the shelf in the pool, behind the tree, on the train, etc. Prepositional phrases can act as either adjectives or adverbs. So this is kind of where this is a little bit different, right? Most of our modifiers describe nouns. Our participial phrases, when they're at the end of the sentence, do not, right? They describe the whole clause. Prepositional phrases can be either adjectives or adverbs, kind of like participial phrases. Now, when they act as adjectives, so they are describing a noun, they're going to describe the noun immediately before, right? So they want to be as close as humanly possible. The books in my collection belong to my grandfather. So here, in my collection is describing books. That's where they are. They're in my collection. Right? That makes sense. We saw that same kind of thing with bench uh, by the pond. By the pond describes bench. Makes sense. It is the bench that is by the pond. However, when prepositional phrases act as adverbs, right? So they are describing verbs, right? When they act as adverbs, they describe the whole clause either before or after. Oof, yeah, so they're describing the action, again, just like participial modifiers. But here, it can be before, it can be after, doesn't really matter where. This is a little bit harder to deal with. So for instance, I go to bed at 11 o'clock. Now the closest noun is bed but bed at 11 o'clock, it doesn't make sense that at 11 o'clock would describe a bed. Why would a bed have a time? It just doesn't make sense. It's instead gonna describe this whole clause, the action of me going to bed. I do that at 11 o'clock. So, even though it's right next to a noun, it doesn't make sense that it describes that noun, so it's going to describe the whole thing. Now, it's possible we could have something at the end that does describe the noun. So, this again comes down to logical meaning. Unfortunately, we have to use our brains to go which makes sense. So we're going to determine what the prepositional phrase describes. Is it an adjective describing a noun in the sentence? Or is it an adverb describing an entire clause? Then once we decide what it describes, we need to figure out is it unambiguously placed? Where it is, could it describe another noun? Could it describe another verb? Is it clear from the placement what it describes. So, an example here. Let's call this option one and this option two. We saw a saber-toothed tiger on a field trip to the Natural History Museum versus option two, on a field trip to the Natural History Museum, we saw a saber-toothed tiger. Which one do you think is correct? Option one or two, logically. Which one is more clear?
in the chat. One or two. Gonna let us get a couple more answers in. All right, we've got a little bit of debate on this one. Keep popping your answers in. So technically, these are both grammatically correct. They are both grammatical. However, if we take a look at the first one, we saw a saber-toothed tiger on a field trip to the Natural History Museum. So to the Natural History Museum describes field trip, right? That makes sense. On a field trip, what does that describe? Well, it could describe where we saw a saber-toothed tiger. We saw a saber-toothed tiger. That happened while we were on a field trip. But, yeah, vip love. Or is it the saber-toothed tiger who's on a field trip? So we're standing in New York and we're like, hey, hanging out, looking around, and then we see, going up the steps into the Natural History Museum, a saber-toothed tiger on a field trip. Bunch of tigers going to the museum, going to learn about their heritage, right? That doesn't make sense. There are no saber-toothed tigers anymore. The saber-toothed tigers were long extinct before natural history museums existed. So that isn't particularly logical, but it is a little bit ambiguous, right? Is it the saber-toothed tiger? So. Yeah, it probably isn't a particularly logical meaning that the saber-toothed tiger would be on a field trip, so probably this is okay. However, what two does is it eliminates any ambiguity. We're going on a field trip to the Natural History Museum. It's at the beginning of the sentence, so we know it's not describing a noun. It's not acting as an adjective. It's acting as an adverb. So it's describing, oops, gonna underline that, not squiggly. It's going to describe this whole thing. We saw a saber-toothed tiger. So it's describing where we saw it. Um, quick correction. Um, in the chat, uh, I'm seeing Shashank says, hey, two is passive. Doesn't matter. Um, it's also not passive. So one, not passive. Two, passive voice is not grammatically incorrect. So. That it's not a very good reason to roll something out unless you're completely out of other options. So here, this second option is better. The first option, probably pretty clear because the option where the tiger is going on the field trip probably doesn't make much sense, but it's still there as a potential option. So option number two is better because it clears up any possible ambiguity. All right, we're going to try an example of this here. So this is loaded with some prepositional phrases. Some might be adjectives, some might be adverbs. We're going to use logic to try to figure out, do they describe adjectives or adverbs? What does it make sense that this would describe? Go ahead and give it a go. Two minutes in the chat.
All right, nice work. Yeah, I think everybody ended up with E or came around to E. Yeah, E is the correct answer. Now, B, C, and D, I think, are relatively easy to eliminate. A, I think a couple of folks maybe were going that direction. So looking at A, this one is probably the second best option. So let's go ahead and look at this one. The nephew of Pliny the Elder wrote the only eyewitness account of the great eruption of Vesuvius in two letters to the historian Tacitus. Now here, it's pretty clear what they mean, <laughs> but yeah, as issue 261288 says, slight ambiguity, is it saying he wrote all of this in the letters? Or is it saying the great eruption of Vesuvius was in the letters? Now it's pretty clear it's not that, right? That's pretty clear, but it's still grammatically ambiguous. Whereas A, it is not grammatically ambiguous at all because it's at the beginning of the sentence. Has to be an adverb, has to describe the whole clause. So it describes where the nephew wrote the only eyewitness account of the great eruption of Vesuvius. Yeah, um, yeah, in the chat, Viplov, yeah, being we're not huge fans of, so we're kind of skeptical of this one. D, this one is a little bit repetitive because we've got account and then accounted for, writing the only eyewitness account, the nephew accounted for the eruption. And then again, we have in two letters to the historian where it maybe could describe the great eruption of Vesuvius. <laughs> right not quite clear and then see kind of the same thing the only eyewitness account is in two letters by the nephew writing to the historian tacitus an account the ordering is just a little bit goofy it's also the longest option which already we're kind of like mm, right so if it's the longest option the ordering seems a little goofy we're gonna go ahead and go with a simpler option all right, nice work here. All right, moving on to our last modifier misconception. So this is not one where it's about describing the closest thing, right? The first three were all kind of breaking that rule about how modifiers describe the thing that's closest to them. Now here, this is, okay, we've talked about our four different modifiers. We talk about how they sometimes break the rules. Now we're gonna talk about modifiers in parallelism, right? So we're gonna go ahead and look at parallelism with modifiers. Now modifiers can, I don't know what the and's down there, modifiers can be featured in parallel constructions, right? So Kit Carson roamed the Rockies and the Southwest working as a trapper and establishing a reputation as one of the most able mountain men of his time. We've seen this one before, right? Because these are two different participial phrases describing Kit Carson roamed the Rockies and the Southwest, right? So we've got two of them separated with an and, which is a classic sign that we have parallelism. And this is parallel, right? Working, establishing, pretty clearly parallel. However, <laughs> modifiers are only parallel to other modifiers of the same type. So that means that we can't mix and match modifiers of different types. So if we had a witch in the second one, we would need a witch in this first one. If we've got a positive as a second one, we need an appositive as the first one. If we have a prepositional phrase as the second one, we need a prepositional phrase as the first one. And if we've got a participial phrase as the first one, we need a participial phrase as the second one, right? They need to match in their structure. So the type of the modifiers is going to determine whether or not they are parallel. So we need to be able to define, is this a participial phrase, so an ing or an ed? Is this a relative clause, so a wh or that? Is this an appositive, so that's a noun phrase, or a prepositional phrase, something that starts with a preposition? 
and that's what determines whether or not it's parallel. So let's go ahead and take a look at an example question where we're looking at parallelism with modifiers. Now this is a gross question, this is a difficult one. Look how long this is, Blech. right? So we're gonna go ahead and give this a shot. Go ahead and take two minutes. If we need more time, we can take a little bit more than that. Two minutes, think parallelism. Good luck. All right, nice work. I'm seeing that most everybody picked E, which is the correct answer. So let's go ahead and talk about why that is the correct answer. So we're going, okay. I see each of these, the beginning of the sentence gets shifted around a little bit, but I see this comma. And this comma is going to set off in all of these answer choices a modifier, right? Okay, we don't get one in C, so that's a little weird. But we get one in A, we get one in B, we get one in D, we get one in E, right? Okay, in A, directly employing, that's a participial phrase. Directly employed in B, a participial phrase. In C, no modifier. In D, directly employing, Oh wait, sorry, I totally lied about B. <laughs> We've got a witch beforehand. So that's gonna be a relative clause. Back to D, I-N-G, that's gonna be a participial phrase. And then in E, we've got a witch. So that's gonna be a relative clause. All right, so we're going, all right, which one do I want, right? So we could try to think through the logic of it. And a lot of these actually logically make sense because they move around this first portion of the sentence a lot. So what we might be better served doing is hunting through the rest of the sentence to kind of go, what structure am I even dealing with here? What's going on? And what we're gonna see is the word and. Oh, and is a parallelism signifier and it's followed by which. And which indirectly supported several million additional jobs Oh, we have parallel modifiers here. So we're going, okay, one thing which indirectly supported, we want a parallel modifier, so if they have the same subject, to also start with which. We want it to be a relative clause. Technically, it doesn't have to start with which. It could be like who or where or when, but that wouldn't really make sense here because we're referring to a noun. Probably wouldn't make sense for something that we could refer to with a which 
to also be something we could refer to with a who or a where or a when. So we want another relative clause, which means that A is out, C is out, D is out. All right, so we're between B and E. So we're going, okay, both have a which. Now we have to go back to our rules about relative clauses. No matter where a relative clause is, it's going to describe the closest noun or noun phrase. All right, in B, the closest noun is World War II. So World War II employed over 16 million, million soldiers. No, World War II didn't employ anyone. It's a war, it's not an employer. What employed people was the Department of Defense. So no, it's not defense. It doesn't make sense that defense would employ anyone, even though it's a noun. It's not an employer. So we instead have Department of Defense. The Department of Defense, which directly employed. Answer is E. Can which, where, and when be parallel? Technically, because they are all relative clauses, but you'll find that there really aren't a lot, if any, cases where those words could describe the same thing, right? Because where is a place, when is a time, which is a thing, right? So maybe which and where, that could be grammatically correct. It would just also have to logically make sense. Um, yeah, the DOD employed the soldiers, not World War II, so that's important. Uh, video is probably only going to be another five minutes, and then I'm going to stick around for questions. We got one more question, kind of an advanced one, so if you need to cruise, you've got all the content at this point. This is just application. So, last question, another example of parallelism with modifiers, a harder one. Go ahead and give this a go. Two minutes. Answer in the chat. All right, I'm excited about this one because there are a lot of opinions in the chat, a lot of different opinions. Now, some of them are right and a lot of them are wrong and that's okay because this one is here for a reason because this is kind of an advanced application. So, like we discussed on the previous slide, modifiers are parallel to other modifiers of the same type, right? So, participial phrases are parallel to other participial phrases. Now, what a lot of people think is that I need an ing to be parallel to an ing, or I need an ed to be parallel to an ed. 
but I don't. Because both ING's and ED's are participial phrases. They can be parallel to each other, just like which and where technically can be parallel to each other because they are both relative clauses. Just like I can say, I like to read on the train, under the tree, and in my backyard. Those all start with different prepositions, but they're parallel because they're all prepositions. They're all prepositional phrases. So I can have a participial phrase be parallel to another participial phrase, even if one is an ing and one is an ed. So using that, going to this question, for parallelism reason, I can only really eliminate e because of this has been, right? That's it. All of the other ones are parallel. ED, ED, ING, 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 ED, ED, ING. Crap. <laughs> so what do I do? Right? What's going on here? So in this case, we have to use logic to go which makes more sense, ING and ED. And I had a question about this in the chat. So, here we're gonna kinda think about tense. So, ing we can use kind of whenever, right? For something that continues, right? So it can be past, it can be present, future, whatever. That's cool. But ed, that's past, right? That is something that has happened, right? So, taking a look at this, we're going, okay, Due to the slow moving nature of tectonic plate movement, okay, that's all modifier, don't care. The oldest ocean crust is thought to date from the Jurassic period. All right, all of that, don't really care. Now this is describing the oldest ocean crust because this is, these are two participial phrases, so they describe the whole thing, so the oldest ocean crust, blah, 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 blah right? So the oldest ocean crust formed. Is it still forming or did it form in the past? Well, I mean, I don't know. Has it been forming for 200 million years? Probably not. It makes more sense for it to be in the past. So B and C are out. All right. Lasted versus lasting 200 million years. Well, we know the oldest crust is. It's the oldest right now, which means it still exists. So if we said lasted 200 million years, that means it's done lasting, right? It's broken up or something has happened and it's no longer there, but it's still there. So we can't have lasted, we need lasting. Answer is D. So even though it's an ED and an ING, they are both participial phrases and therefore both parallel. And those are the four, some of the four most common, I won't say they're the four most common, but four of the most common ways that people mess up modifiers. They are common modifiers misconceptions. So should you totally forget the general rule that in general we want modifiers to be close to the things they describe? No, it's true in most cases. However, we need to know the exceptions to those cases. So placement in the sentence when dealing with participial phrases, um, nouns versus noun phrases, specifically when dealing with relative clauses, which are not as specific as you think, but also a positives and also with participial phrases, right? We saw that there too. So with all of them, could be a noun phrase versus a noun. And then with prepositional phrases, whether or not we're describing a noun or a verb. And then with parallelism, making sure that they match each other in terms of type. Not just what they look like, but type. All right, and that is it. So if you guys have any questions on modifiers in general or on some of these questions or about Veritas Prep or about me or about the classes that I run with Veritas Prep, let me know in the chat. Um, I'll stick around for a few more minutes. If you want to cruise on out, thanks for being here. I hope you learned something. Um, yeah, go ahead and pop those in the chat. I'll be right here. Yeah, no problem to those of you who are heading out. Thanks for being here. Thanks for participating, everyone. Great group. Mm. 
So, Manik's asking, how can the modifier jump the verb is thought to date? Um, so it's, it's not jumping the verb. So this is an ED or an ING modifier. So this is a participial phrase. And like we discussed in rule number one, participial phrases describe the whole clause. So it's describing the oldest ocean crust is thought to date from the Jurassic period formed. Cool. How is formed parallel with lasting? Because they're the same type. <laughs> uh, there's really no more uh, to it than that. They are both participial phrases, therefore both parallel. Um, can we do a s video on subject verb agreement and pronouns? Ooh, I would love to. We'll see. Um, if, if the opportunity comes up, I would love to do that. Uh, thank you for the suggestion. Um, can which violate the touch rule? Um, so it can't jump verbs, right? But like we discussed, it can describe either just the noun word right next to it or the entire noun phrase, right? So it's technically touching the whole noun phrase, but it's modifying the base of it. So the example would be the bench by the pond, which was recently painted, right? Technically, it's right next to pond, but it's also right next to bench by the pond. It doesn't make sense that the pond would be painted, so this one refers to the bench by the pond. So technically, it's kind of jumping that uh, prepositional phrase to describe bench, but really it's just describing the whole thing. But yeah, it will never jump a verb. Um, be, 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 be. Is it still, is it wrong to still go by feel of which is the correct sentence? Um, I really don't recommend that unless you are absolutely desperate at like the very, very end of your rope. You don't know what's going on. You can't identify any differences or if you can't identify the differences, you don't know the rule. You got no clue. At that point, then you can go by feel. But if you're going by feel pretty frequently, that probably means that you need to take a step back and do some grammar review because that's really going to help you. Do, 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 do. Um, okay, yeah, quick question on essential versus non-essential modifiers. Basically, the idea here, an essential modifier is something that is needed for the sentence. A non-essential modifier is something that is not needed for the sentence. So an essential modifier is going to be something, never something that's grammatically needed. Modifiers will never be grammatically needed for a sentence, ever, which is why slash and burn works. We can get rid of it. It's gone and we'll still ideally have a complete sentence. If we don't, that answer is not correct, right? Um, but with an essential modifier, what that means is that the meaning of the sentence is lost if I lose that modifier. But if I have an inessential modifier, that means if I lose the modifier, I still know what the sentence is saying. A really great example of an essential modifier would be um, dogs trained by professionals are more well behaved, right? If I lose trained by professionals, I have dogs are more well behaved. Which dogs? Then who? Then what? It just doesn't make sense anymore. So that is an essential modifier because it is necessary to the meaning. So typically with essential modifiers, they're not going to have commas on either side. With non-essential modifiers, they are going to have commas on either side. So what the commas signify is I am not necessary to the meaning of the sentence. You can take me out and you'll still have a sentence that you can interpret. Hopefully that makes sense. But yeah, rules are going to be largely the same for them. So that actually kind of gets into where participial phrases at the end of a sentence can be a little hairy. If we've got an essential modifier at the end of the sentence, so it doesn't have a comma, it might just describe the noun next to it. But typically if it's an inessential modifier, so non-essential, it's got a comma, that typically means it's describing the whole clause. So again, just approach when it's at the end of the sentence with logic. In most cases, it's non-essential, it's describing the whole clause. Just be careful if it doesn't have a comma. All right. Uh, blah, 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 blah. Are different relative clauses also parallel? Grammatically, yes, just check for logic to make sure it makes sense, because it might not make sense. Um, same with INGs and EDs, you still have to check for logic. So here it makes sense that the crust would be formed and that the crust would 
lasting, right? That those both make sense, but sometimes an ED would not make sense. Uh, will we be doing a CR video in the future? Maybe. Um, I, I do have a CR video kind of in the works for the Veritas Prep channel, so stay tuned there um, for that one. Um, subscribe hit the bell, all that good stuff, <laughs> whatever it is that YouTubers say. Um, so if you do wanna see that, there should be a shorter video, not you know totally inclusive of everything, but some stuff there on our channel. Will there be another CR webinar here? I don't know if I'm gonna do one, but there have been a lot of really good CR webinars already on the channel, some of them done by uh, my coworkers. So definitely go check those out. Those are recorded on the GMAT Club channel. Um, and then there may be some in the future, I just don't personally know at this point. Um, burr, 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 burr. Let's see. When should we break the sentence if it is grammatical? I'm not sure I understand the question, Jai Gamer 9394. Um, if you want to rephrase that, um, yeah, I don't quite understand what you mean by break the sentence. Um, so Praveen, um, you definitely want to review participial phrases, right? Our first rule is that participial phrases describe the whole thing, right? Um, when they're at the end of the sentence, they can describe the whole thing. So if this didn't have a comma, maybe it could refer to Jurassic period, but it does have a comma, so it's gonna refer to the whole thing. So the subject doing the verb, blah, 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 blah. That is true for an ING or an ED. Review your participial modifiers. A lot of people think this only applies to ING. It also applies to ED. Cool. Um, do I have any other pre-recorded videos on YouTube? Yeah, I do. Um, if you just search GMAT on YouTube, you'll find um, me in the first couple of results. Um, yeah, uh, I have a lot of videos for um, some other channels. I have some previous live streams that I've done with a couple of other places. I have some pre-recorded videos that I have um, on some other channels. Um, I do not have any currently for Veritas Prep, but I'm hoping those will be coming out in the next few weeks. So go ahead and subscribe there if you wanna see more like recent content. But yeah, I definitely do have stuff already out there. Take a look, I've got a lot of good stuff that I'm proud of, I think is good. All right. All right. Ba -ba -ba. Okay, so Jai Gamer 93, 94. Yeah, a lot of these were going, okay, um, these are technically grammatically correct, right? Technically, it's describing a noun. Technically, it is describing whatever, right? It just doesn't make logical sense. Right, so the thing about these modifiers and these modifier misconceptions is that some of them are grammatical, but a lot more of them are logical, right? So we need to go ahead and just check to see does this make logical sense as well as grammatical sense. So just because there's a noun there doesn't mean that it could logically describe that noun. So the one that we might be thinking of is this one. So let me just really quickly erase the changes we made. So here, an advancement that has already reduced successful attacks by over 50%, right? Oh, no, this is probably not the one. Eh, whatever. Um, so we're going, okay, technically, because this has to describe a noun, it could describe cyber attacks. Technically, that would be grammatically correct. However, if we think about it logically, cyber attacks, why would they be an advancement that reduced successful attacks? That doesn't really make sense. So then we're gonna go, okay, it's not describing cyber attacks, it's describing the whole noun phrase, a new approach for dealing with increasingly troublesome cyber attacks. Hopefully that makes more sense. So logic on top of grammar. Um, where can we practice 700 level questions? Uh, great question. Um, the best resource of any gold standard is real test questions. So from uh, the MBA store, that is the best. Um, however, there are not 
an infinite number of questions <laughs> from the MBA store. So for additional questions, you're gonna have to go to a test prep company. Um, or a forum like GMAT Club. There are tons of questions on GMAT Club and they have a nice little tag for 700 level questions. That's a really great place to look. Um, if you do wanna go with a test prep company, just make sure to do your research to see are these problems accurate? Do I trust the instructors? So if you liked today's session and you thought that I knew what I was talking about, maybe Veritas Rep would be a good choice because um, I am an instructor and writer there. So. Make sure to do your research before you go with it. Just because something says it's 700 level doesn't mean it is 700 level or that it is actually good. Veritas Prep tends to have kind of harder questions, so it is a good one that way. Um, doo -doo 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 -doo. All right, and then Samarth, yeah, because uh, verb ing's can take any tense. Technically, it's not wrong to have forming in that example. So on the wrong page. It's just that because we have forming, it does not indicate the tense. So when we have forming, we could go, is it still forming? Is that still happening, right? If I go formed, that makes it clear that it was past tense, that it is done, right? So that increases the clarity here, and that's why we would choose formed instead of forming. Um, yeah, so past participles in the middle do modify the closest noun or noun phrase, in the middle. We're talking about at the end, right? So the rule at the beginning, in the middle, participial phrases, ing's or ed's, both modify closest noun. At the end, it does not modify the closest noun, or it doesn't have to modify the closest noun. It most of the time is going to modify the entire clause. So again, <laughs> maybe rewatch this afterward to review what the rule was. It's pretty clearly laid out on the slide just to make sure you're clear. So EGMAT is not wrong in what it said. In the middle, it does describe the closest noun. At the end, not necessarily the case. All right, does Veritas Prep have classes for IR? Yes, one of the classes we teach is an IR AWA class um, that is part of our live online class series. Um, it doesn't get as much attention as the other, other subjects, just full disclosure, because it's not as important to grad schools um, and getting a really high score is not as important even to the schools that care about IR and AWA. But it does get a class um, as part of the sequence. Um, I think it is actually the last class that we do. All right, I am gonna go ahead and wrap up the video and then any other questions that you guys have, I'm gonna answer those in the chat. Um, I'm just gonna go ahead and bop back to our first slide, which had our overview here. All right, um, I'm gonna go ahead and answer that all of your questions in the chat. Thank you so much for being here, everyone who's still here, great participation. Hopefully I'll see you guys soon.